Hi, this is Minna from True Crime Finland. Ah, Finland, so peaceful and quiet. There isn't even any crime there, right? Wrong. Join me every two weeks in discovering the dark side of the land of a thousand lakes. From legendary and infamous to the lesser known and forgotten Finnish cases, the podcast will be sure to offer something for everyone. Find True Crime Finland wherever you get your podcasts. Norway reeling from twin attacks. First, a suspected car bomb. Thomas Quick was known as Sweden's worst serial killer. Quick was convicted. Kim Vahl disappeared after boarding Madsen submarine in Copenhagen Harbor last August. Terrorism, miscarriages of justice, serial killers, disappearances. From the known to the lesser known, we give you true crime from the dark and frozen regions of northern Europe. This is Nordic True Crime. Subscribe to our bi-weekly episodes on iTunes, Spotify, or on your podcast provider. And find us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram at Nordic True Crime. Over the course of 25 years, a sophisticated, medium-sized city in Canada was ravaged by 29 gruesome murders, most of them committed by three sadistic killers. The city is London, Ontario, and with little notice or fanfare, London quietly became the serial killer capital of the world. From the south shore of Lake Erie, this is Great Lakes True Crime. Before we get started, I want to give a shout out to our biggest supporter, Nancy M. from Canada. Thanks so much for your support, Nancy. We really appreciate it. And thanks to all of you for listening. If you like the show, please tell a friend about it. London, Ontario lies two hours by car west of Toronto along Highway 401. Known for many decades as the Forest City, The town is the birthplace of Justin Bieber, Ryan Gosling, and Rachel McAdams. And between 1959 and 1984, it was home to the largest known concentration of serial killers in the world. 13 of the 29 murders can be attributed to three killers who were eventually caught and convicted. They were Gerald Thomas Archer, who was known as the London Chambermaid Slayer, Christian McGee, whose nickname was the Mad Slasher, and Russell Johnson, known as the Balcony Killer. That's quite a group they got there. Sixteen of the murders are still considered cold. Dennis Alsop, a detective sergeant with the Ontario Provincial Police, was based in the London area between 1950 and 1979. He kept all of his notes and research on the murders from throughout his career, and upon his retirement, he hid them in his home, where they remained until he died in 2012. Dennis was afraid that if they were left at work, they would be boxed up and forgotten about, never to be followed up on. He actually left the documents to his son, who ultimately turned them over to police. Dr. Michael Arnfield wrote the book Murder City, the untold story of Canada's serial killer capital, 1959 to 1984, which is where much of the information in this episode came from. I highly recommend you check out the book. In the book, Dr. Arnfield said that Dennis Alsop, through his diary entries, said that he felt that he knew 
who committed a lot of those 16 murders, and he was basically stonewalled from making arrests because prosecutors thought he didn't have enough information and they wanted a slam dunk. So he kept tabs on these people on his own time, and it seems that at least in one of these cases, there are other victims in Toronto that could be connected to one of the killers from London. Now let's stop for a minute here. If you're a true crime podcast junkie like me, you've undoubtedly heard many stories like this where prosecutors won't move forward with trying a case because they feel they don't have strong enough evidence. So they let suspected killers walk free, for decades in some cases, all because they're afraid of a not guilty verdict, which would let the killers walk free, for decades in some cases. It doesn't always make a lot of sense until you remember that prosecutors are politicians who want to get reelected first and foremost. Based on similarities between crime scenes and with the help of resources and technologies that were not available to the original investigators, Arntfield concludes that there was at least one and as many as four serial killers operating in London during this time frame with similar modus operandi who were responsible for the unsolved murders. So even if these cold cases were all the work of one serial killer instead of a number of killers, London would still maintain the record for having the largest verified concentration of serial killers operating in one place at one time. Congratulations, London. Arnfield said, New York and Los Angeles at any given time have had four or five, but London at the time had a mean population of 170,000. In megacities like New York and Los Angeles, the per capita equivalent would be about 80 or 90 per city. So the question is, why London? Why did London have so many serial killers operating at one time? Well, what made London such an attractive place for serial killing is, of course, not really known, but Dr. Arnfield presents some theories in his book. First of all, London is one of those cities that is frequently used as a test market for major brands that want to introduce new products or restaurants to Canada. It turns out that when you look at London's population, average income, and demographics, it's extremely average. Congratulations again, London. It's so average, in fact, that it's a good proxy for the nation of Canada as a whole. And it's a city that marketers have historically depended on to determine whether a product will succeed countrywide. Some American cities that similarly serve as test markets, cities like Richmond, Virginia, Muncie, Indiana, and Rochester, New York, have had similar histories with violent crime rates higher than the national average. Dr. Arnfield said, quote, It's not that having the McRib first or being a test market city makes you a haven for serial killers. It's that the underlying sociological factors that make those places preferred locales for marketers also seem to seem disproportionate numbers of offenders, end quote. Another factor that makes London more susceptible to serial killers is Highway 401, which runs along the southern border of the province of Ontario and was constructed four years before the U.S. interstate highway system came about. Dr. Arnfield points out that studies show from 1956 on, the criminal landscape changed dramatically, both figuratively and literally. In fact, the FBI has since developed a Highway Serial Killings Initiative to investigate the connection between major highways and serial killers. Another factor is that London is more remote than most major urban areas, while still providing access to a large enough population base for the killers to pursue potential victims. Such isolated cities also tend to have a lack of informal social control, Arnfield said, and lack the major media and communication networks of major cities. Basically, London is big enough to provide anonymity, but too small to have sophisticated media and law enforcement connections like you'd find in Toronto or Detroit. During the time period the book covers, which again was 1959 to 1984, There was no formal system for record sharing between police departments, and local, provincial, and federal police were slow to identify consistencies between murder scenes. There were no sexual predator registries, no centralized databases, no DNA registries. Police departments operated very independently of one another. 
This is the first part of a two-part series on London, Ontario and its serial killers. Before we get into the serial killers, though, let's set the stage for this time period in London. Let's talk about 12-year-old Lynn Harper. Cheryl Lynn Harper, as she was formerly known, was born to Leslie and Shirley Harper on August 31, 1946, in Moncton, New Brunswick. She had one older brother, Barry, who lived in Ohio, and a younger brother, Jeffrey. Her father was a school teacher before he joined the military in 1940. They relocated to the Royal Canadian Air Force Base at Clinton, Ontario in July of 1957. Lynn spent a lot of her time going to Sunday school and being active in the Girl Guides. On June 9, 1959, 12-year-old Lynn disappeared near the Air Force Base in Clinton in what is now Van Astra, which is about 50 miles or 80 kilometers north of London. Two days later, on the afternoon of June 11th, her body was discovered in a nearby farm woodlot. She had been raped and strangled with her own blouse. Stephen Truscott and Lynn had been classmates in a combined 7th and 8th grade class at their school on the north side of the Air Force Base. In the early evening of Tuesday, June 9th, the night she disappeared, Stephen gave Lynn a ride on the crossbar of his bicycle and proceeded from the vicinity of the school northwards along the county road. The timing and duration of their encounter and what happened while they were together have been contentious issues ever since 1959. On June 12th, shortly after 7 p.m., Stephen was taken into custody. Less than eight hours later, he was charged with capital murder which is the equivalent to first-degree murder today, under the provisions of the Juvenile Delinquents Act. On June 30th, Stephen was ordered to be tried as an adult. Despite his young age, 14, a guilty verdict in the capital murder trial would mean he would receive capital punishment, death by hanging, to be specific. Now, it's been asserted that the town of Clinton viewed the attack on Lynn as an attack on the entire community as a whole and their way of life. Thus, they demanded that someone be held accountable, and very swiftly. After two Ontario Provincial Police officers surveyed the area where the body was found, a narrative was quickly devised to fit the evidence. In court, the Crown contended that Stephen and Lynn left the county road before reaching the bridge over the Bayfield River and in a wooded area beside the county road, known as Lawson's Bush, Stephen assaulted and killed Lynn. For his part, Stephen has maintained his innocence since 1959, stating that he dropped off Lynn unharmed. He looked back toward the intersection where he had dropped her off and saw a vehicle stopped with Lynn getting in. On June 10, 1959, at 9.30 a.m., Stephen was interviewed by police in a cruiser at his school. Stephen elaborated that while standing on the bridge, he saw Lynn get into a late model Chevrolet and there was a lot of chrome on the car and it could have been a Bel Air. At 11.20 p.m. that evening, Lynn's father reported her missing. Stephen Truscott's trial began on September 16, 1959, in what was then the Supreme Court of Ontario. From the beginning, Stephen faced an uphill battle. The trial took place well before modern rules for disclosure were instituted. Exculpatory evidence was ignored by the Crown. Statements from witnesses were picked and chosen to fit the prosecutor's narrative, and all the evidence presented in court against Stephen was circumstantial at best, and centered on placing Lynn's death within a narrow time frame which implicated Stephen. The basis for the identification of this very narrow window of time in which Lynn supposedly died was the autopsy doctor's testimony that the decomposition of Lynn's body and the state of partially digested food in her stomach indicated that she had died near the precise time that she was acknowledged to have been with Stephen. It was later pointed out that insect activity on Lynn's body was capable of raising a reasonable doubt whether she died within the time frame of that night 
that was stated by the autopsy doctor, and it could suggest she died as late as the next day. Samples of insects and maggots were collected from the body at the time, but the science of entomology has since evolved, so we know a lot more now than we did then. Aside from that, several eyewitnesses offered accounts that contradicted the tight time frame pushed by the prosecution, but they were never called to testify in court. Speculation that Lynn may have been hitchhiking to her grandmother's house, about two hours away, was originally sent out on the wire by police to neighboring jurisdictions the night of her disappearance. But that information was later removed from the police file and was never presented in court. On September 30th, the jury returned a verdict of guilty. But they included a plea for leniency, which was rare for such a brutal crime at that time, but was likely an acknowledgment of Stephen's young age. No mercy was shown, though, as Justice Ronald Ferguson had no choice in the matter. 14-year-old Stephen Truscott was sentenced to death by hanging. Much of the evidence collected was disposed of by police after the trial. Stephen was effectively disposed of as well by the community. Photos of him were burned, and his name was not spoken in public. It was almost as if the crime never occurred and Stephen never existed. Perhaps it was easier to cope with that way. Although Stephen expected to be hanged before he saw his 15th birthday, the government of Canada had no interest in executing a child. They commuted his sentence to life in prison. From the time of his arrest until the commutation of his death sentence, Stephen was imprisoned at the Huron County Jail in Ontario. After the sentence was commuted, he was transferred to the Kingston Penitentiary for assessment, and he was incarcerated at the Ontario Training School for Boys in Guelph from February 1960 to January 1963. On January 14, 1963, he was transferred to Collins Bay Penitentiary. Stephen was again transferred on May 7, 1967, to the Farm Annex of Collins Bay Penitentiary. On October 21, 1969, about 10 years after Lynn's murder, Stephen was released on parole and moved to Kingston, Ontario with his parole officer, and then in Vancouver for a brief period before settling in Guelph under a new name. Stephen eventually got married and raised three children. He lived as normal a life as possible and maintained a low profile until 2000, when an interview on CBC Television's investigative news program called The Fifth Estate revived interest in his case. The program provided an in-depth investigation into the circumstances of Stephen's arrest and conviction, which led to the national collective outrage in Canada. A 2001 book by Julian Scher titled Until You Are Dead went even more in-depth into unraveling the original investigation and shed even more light into how Stephen was wronged back in 1959. In a sense, Lynn was not the only victim of her murder. On November 28, 2001, the Association in Defense of the Wrongly Convicted filed an appeal to have Stephen's case reopened. On January 24, 2002, retired Quebec Justice Fred Kaufman was appointed by the government to review the case. On October 28, 2004, the Court of Appeal for Ontario was directed to review whether new evidence would have changed the 1959 verdict. On April 6, 2006, the body of Lynn was exhumed by order of the Attorney General of Ontario in order to test for DNA evidence. There was hope that this would bring some closure to the case, or at least some answers, but no usable DNA was recovered from the remains that were exhumed. Stephen's conviction was brought to the Court of Appeal for Ontario on June 19, 2006. The five-judge panel heard three weeks of testimony and fresh evidence. Arguments were heard by the court over a period of ten days in 2007. The Court of Appeal heard evidence, including earlier versions of draft autopsy reports, that contradicted the supposedly narrow window for Lynn's time of death. 
pathologist Dr. John Penniston had in fact provided three different estimates for this time period, the first two of which would have excluded Stephen as a suspect. Only after the police had narrowed on Stephen as the prime suspect did Penniston change the narrative that Lynn had died exactly around the time that implicated Stephen. His original estimates and draft autopsy reports were concealed from the defense and the court. So on August 28, 2007, nearly 50 years after Lynn's murder, Stephen was finally acquitted of the charges. Attorney General of Ontario Michael Bryant apologized to Stephen on behalf of the provincial government, stating he had suffered a miscarriage of justice and that the Crown would not appeal the ruling. Stephen said he was just elated when he heard the news while traveling from Guelph to Toronto. He said, It didn't immediately sink in because I was prepared for the worst, which has happened every time in the past. He went on to say, I never in my wildest dreams expected in my lifetime for this to come true, so it's a dream come true. The following year, in July 2008, the province of Ontario announced that Stephen was being awarded a $6.5 million compensation package for his years of wrongful imprisonment. He and his wife called the compensation a final and long-awaited step in recognizing Stephen's innocence although they said the money was bittersweet. Lynn's family, on the other hand, have never thought that Stephen was innocent of the murder, still wanting someone to be held accountable. Sadly, as so much time has passed since the brutal crime, we may never know who murdered Lynn. Four years after Lynn's murder, beginning in 1963, the city of London would become besieged by serial killers. We'll examine those cases in the next episode. You've been listening to Great Lakes True Crime. Please don't forget to leave us a positive review in your podcast app and follow us on Twitter at Great Lakes Crime. Thanks for listening, guys.